Yeah. Okay, so uh, Dr. Peter Cini is an associate professor at Shimano University where he teaches British literature, culture, and philosophy. Uh, Dr. Cini previously taught philosophy and literature at the University of Kent in England and in Japan at Fukuoka University, Kyushu University, Miyazaki International College, Doboshisha University, and Kyoto Notre Dame University. Along with several other publications, Dr. Cini is the author of Coleridge's Contemplative Philosophy, a comprehensive exploration of Coleridge's philosophy. And incidentally, <laughs> this is what we're going to be talking about today. So did I get everything right there? Yes, thank you. Okay, well, uh, you're up. It's, it's all you now. Thanks. Uh, what, what, what is this session? Is it about an hour or so? Um, how long do we have? We have an hour and a half, I think, booked. But you can talk, I mean, I give you 45, sure. and you talk, and then you answer questions for 45. That's what we've been doing. Hmm. Sure. So, um, yes. Oh, um, also, do you have the, is this a pro account of Zoom? Because um, the non-pro ones cut out after 40 minutes. This is this is the pro account, yeah. Good, jolly good. Okay. So uh, I think Emil has given you a handout, which is, um, let me see, chapter uh, six from that book on uh, on the philosophy of, of Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Um, so let me move to the same place in my own my own copy. I sent that an email for everybody. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this chapter in the book is um, pretty much exactly halfway through the book. <clears throat> and that halfway position uh, is relevant. And I take um, the subject of this chapter to be the crux. What's a crux? A crux is like the center of an X, you know, the crossover point where opposites connect, um, the, the melting pot, the crucible, uh, the, you know, the center of opposed polarities um and so you know this 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 chapter um is a kind of uh, is is looking at a, a schema that i think is very central to the philosophy of samuel taylor coleridge the previous uh, chapters in the book were talking about coleridge um and his observations of nature and then his theory of imagination and they were building up from simple aesthetics, which is just the aesthetics of sense. That is, you know, you open your eyes, you smell the smells around you, you hear the sounds around you, you start getting imaginative, um, having a, an aesthetic connection to nature and the world around you, and then creating a kind of uh, personal culture, family culture, community culture, and these are all, it's kind of a ladder that you're climbing up aesthetically. And then the later chapters in the book are moving beyond that. A little bit like how Plato, you know, the Greek philosopher Plato had this idea, you know, of, um, of he called it, you know, his divided line where you're moving from simple sense to a kind of um, aesthetics and, and theory of opinion and belief and then through to understanding in a kind of semi-scientific way, and then onto something that he called noesis, which for him was a kind of something like true knowledge or direct knowledge. And something interesting there. And, and, and Coleridge too, the, the, the romantic era, late, um, late 18th century and early um, 19th century um, poet, thinker and philosopher. Samuel Taylor Coleridge too agreed pretty much with Plato's idea, pretty much the classical idea of, um, of feeling, thought, opinion and knowledge advancing pretty much like that, you know, feelings. Some people live their life just basically almost always entirely through feeling. And, um, and then opinions, some people pretty much make their, all their judgments through opinions. And then some kind of common sense, um, 
um, understanding, and then a more advanced theoretical understanding. And then, and then finally, something that not everybody has, according to people like Plato, but also Coleridge, um, this thing called noesis, this mode noesis. Um, and the interesting thing here is that, you know, um, opinion and experience and theoretical knowledge, which are all kind of grouped sort of in the middle, you know, lower, middle, higher middle, um, opinion and, 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 and intermediate knowledge and theory are all based on experience. They're all, that is to say, mediated. They're all mediated through experience. You have to learn stuff from just living, from experience first. And then you apply these forms, maybe logical forms, maybe opinions, maybe things that you inherit from your parents or your family, <clears throat> these filters. Whereas, and that's kind of in the middle. Everything in the middle is, is basically conceptual and schematic. You can have theories at the higher end or at the lower end. You just have certain schemas that um, that mediate your opinions. But at the very bottom and the very top of this, if you like, this scale of knowledge, at the very bottom and the very top, you have opposites that are more alike to each other than they are alike to the things in the middle. What does that mean? It means something like absolutely basic sense your sense of smell, your sense of touch, your tastes, your, your feelings, but also um, certain intuitions that you get um, somewhere between feeling and thought. They're often direct. They're not mediated through concepts or theories. They're often direct or as direct as we can get as humans, these brute basic senses. And play, people like Plato, but also Coleridge much, much later, thought that the opposite end of the intellectual spectrum, the high intellect, beyond scientific knowledge even, is something called noesis, which for Plato was a kind of direct and intuitive knowledge of what he thought of as the forms or the ideas, you know, the platonic forms, the platonic ideas, the main, you know, truth and goodness and beauty, but also things like um, uh, courage and piety um, and so on. Um, but and, and and then other thinkers, sometimes in the Renaissance and then later in the Romantic era, added to those things like perhaps the laws of nature are also some kind of archetypal forms that suffuse the universe. And the truths of mathematics, something that Plato and the later Platonists sort of agreed with, um, there are certain truths which are always true which have some kind of existence beyond existence. That's a paradox, you know, we, it makes us wonder what kind of existence is it? It's not exactly an existence like, you know, this pen or this hand or this cup have some kind of concrete existence, but rather they have some being, or maybe even beyond being, they have an essence, you know, um, some kind of hyper usias, something beyond being or beyond essence, but but, well, what are they? You can call them truths if you're struggling to give them a kind of, you know, they're not, they're not things, of course, these ideas or forms. They're not concretes. Um, some, you know, sophisticated people might say they're not even existences uh, because to exist is, is, is to have some kind of manifestation. Um, and these are beyond manifestation. The forms and the ideas are a kind of something like a Pythagorean reality. You know, how might we imagine it? Like reality of ratios and numbers and laws of nature that are the truths and powers and realities behind existence that existence depends upon, you know? Um, and this is what Coleridge is basically, you know, trying, trying to get at. So, and this chapter here, which I've called, you know, the energic energetic distinction and Coleridge's two-level theory of mind. That is, I believe, central, and I put it as a, one of the central chapters in the book, because leading up to that, you have a discussion of um, um, the senses and sensation and basic aesthetics, the feeling and the opinion way of getting to know the world and creating culture. And then beyond that, the sort of scientific and poetic and religious and what you might call the higher spiritual sorts of ways. Um, and 
that crossover point from feeling, the feeling body, the feeling soul, that crosses over into the intellectual mind or spirit, you know. In German, they contrast Seele und Geist, you know, the, the Seele as the sort of uh, the mind of the body. Um, and the Geist or spirit, um, the mind of the spirit, you know. Um, the, 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 the soul, feeling and sensation is what we have in common, certainly, it seems, with, with, with many animals. Um, whereas things like understanding and conceptuality, probably we don't have that in common with most animals. You know, there are arguments for elephants and dogs um, um, and you know, maybe, even, maybe even some insects like bees have some kind of language. Well, it's certainly they have some kind of language as von Frisch discovered with his discovery of the famous dancers of bees. You know, bees can communicate with their beautiful wiggle dance. They wig the, the intensity of their wiggle says how great the nectar is um, and the duration of the wiggle tells us um, uh, how far away it is, you know, and the uh, uh, angle of it uh, is, is actually relative to the uh, light coming from the sun. And that, that, um, that tells the other bees around them, um, you know, exactly which sort of angle of the compass to, to proceed in. Well, that's, that's something amazing. How, how much conceptualization is going on there? Well, I would imagine almost none, you know, or very little, but still there is something um, of an intellectual nature in there, um, whether or not they're just plugged directly into it and there's not much processing going on. It, it, that, that's probably likely, but still, um, it's this 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 higher mind um, that is that is that is being mediated. That is that is something that especially makes us human. It's humane knowledge, but also according to thinkers like Coleridge, but also to people like Plato, um, it's something that they would often use very very powerful words to describe. They would say it what relates us to God, or it is what is divine. It's the divine possibility or spark in human nature. It's, in that sense, Promethean. You know, it's something stolen from the gods or it's something given by the gods or it's a piece of grace. It's spiritual. And people, you know, <clears throat> um, would often, and especially in different strands of Platonism, um, would <clears throat> draw almost naturally to, to, to something religious or at least deeply mysterious and spiritual about the wonders of intellect. Because what the sense, what experience, what empiricism can teach you is, um, is always concrete. It's always about this particular experience and that particular experience. Whereas once you start to get into conceptual understanding, knowledge becomes universal and um, it can be applied everywhere. It's not just about it's not just like suck it and see empiricism, where it applies in a very narrow range of, 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 of circumstances. Um, there, now, the concept, once you get into the understanding, the concepts of necessity, the universal concepts of necessity and universality um, and essence and start to come into it. And then you start to get laws. And then you start to know about the future. What must happen? If X happens, then Y must happen, no matter where you are and no matter when this is happening. Um, and when that first strikes any mind, I mean, I think that often happens, you know, when people are about 14, 15, 16, this, some people can get bowled over by the power of knowledge, you know, you know, knowledge, knowledge, knowledge is power, but the, the ability to, to, to work out what must be a universal truth, you know, is a, a startling power. Kant, Emmanuel Kant remarked on the, the same sort of thing in, in ethics when he said, you know, that the two things which which absolutely startle and amaze him, fill him with awe and wonder, well, this, you know, the starry heavens above him and the moral law within him. And the, and the wonderful thing about that is he worked out a categorical imperative, but truths of ethics that must be true, he believed he had proven, that must be true for all rational beings, even beings which aren't alive yet in the future, even beings on different planets. If, if, if they're rational, they must agree with this. Okay, so, Let's move on with this. Um, so what the, the, the first section in this, this, this chapter here, the energeia of thought, that's reaching, um, you know, uh, back to people like Aristotle and his understanding of potentiality and energy. Um, um, 
something in the mind which is a, a, a potential to work um, and a potential to know, but also a potential to become. Okay. Um, and uh, Coleridge made an interesting distinction between just in, in one or two remarks, in, in, in just two remarks throughout his, you know, millions of words of text, but he, he made a couple of remarks distinguishing between the energic and the energetic. But it's a nice distinction. It, it, it sort of speaks a volume in itself. Um, the energetic is the lower level and the energetic is the higher level. And that's that's sort of an, an entrance into this that I'm talking about as Coleridge's two-level theory of mind. Like Plato, he has the, the sort of the, the um, lower level existences and the higher level essences, in a way. Um, lower level concretes and physicalities and the higher level forms or laws or ar archetypes. Um, and the, if something is energetic, Coleridge, um, it's full of action. Um, it's stimulating change. It's full of um, you know, energy, basically, in, in, in the sense that we use it nowadays. Um, somebody, something is energetic. We would say, you know, toddlers and ch young children are very energetic. Yeah, um, full of energy, always busy, busy. But if something is, en if something is energetic, it means it's um, for him. It's you can be completely still and energetic and, and and highly energetically charged. You know, you could be thinking some deep thought. Um, you could you could be on the on the cusp of some scientific breakthrough, um, or you could be tackling through some some legal problem. And this is you know the the energia of mind um, moving from uh, one position to another. Um, the ability to walk into a room full of energetic activity and to transform it with thought into a concentrated stillness. I've just described, you know, like a, a school teacher, for example, you know, the ability to walk into a room full of highly energetic activity. Think of all the children running around and hey. <laughs> and then this teacher walks in and says a few things that makes the children think and, and, and start to sit still. That is, that is the energic, taking command, or not just taking command, but being worthy of the attention of the energetic. So what is it then? What's going on? It's a kind of ordination. We don't really use that word very much nowadays in English, ordination. It's a traditional meaning is um, when a priest, when a, normal, when, a, when a regular Joe, when a regular person decides to become a priest, for example, and they become ordained. But actually, ordination is not just for, for the priesthood. In, uh, in, 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 in traditional Christianity, if somebody wants to get married, well, then they become ordained as a father or, uh, sorry, as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a husband or as a wife. That's an ordination. Um, in a sense, then it's following a vocation. So whatever job you, you, you take, um, it, and if you take it seriously, you're in a sense ordained. But what is it meaning? It means setting into order and achieving, re receiving a role achieving a certain position with responsibilities and that requires a setting into order setting the chaos as it were around you into order and that becomes your task and what Coleridge recognized is the necessity and the power of the ordination of thought everybody has as it were the lower mind um he he, he drew on 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 on, on you know the, the phrase in in the, in the in the Christian gospel you know the from Nema Sarkos, which means the mind of the body. What's the mind of the body? It's, you know, desire and lust, but also, you know, the need to eat, the need to mate, you know, the need for shelter, all of these things that we share in common with the animals. Um, and then also the, the spiritual mind, you know, the, the, the higher psyche or psuchi, the, 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 the spiritual mind. And it's the... It, it's not enough to recognize that all humans have this, you know, um, dual mind or these two parts, the higher and the lower mind. It's not enough simply to recognize that. The point is to take, once you've recognized it, is to take uh, a kind of responsibility for that and for you to, as it were, identify more with the higher mind and to set 
in order, the lower mind. A lot of people hear this kind of talk and they think, oh, this is just straightforward hierarchical thinking, you know, um, the, 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 the intellectual slightly snobbish and elitist spirit um, is denigrating or looking down upon the body and the instinct. But actually, these are the vital things. These are full of vitality. That's what somebody like Friedrich Nietzsche might say, for example. Don't suppress the body with, with, with this, this pretense at spirit, you know. Um, but it's not, um, but, but the way it's, it's seen in this kind of Platonism, it's not really, it's not really a question of denigration. Rather, it's a matter of elevating that which can be elevated. So it's, there's a kind of fractal pattern here. It's not that the lower mind is always the lower mind. And then the higher mind is, you know, being very bossy and setting everything into order. It's rather the, the higher mind is irradiating, is penetrating its light, light in the sense of knowledge as light, you know. Light is irradiating the instincts and the bodily and animal ways of knowing things, this spiritual way, or cultural and spiritual and geistly, you know, way of knowing, is penetrating into, as it were, colouring the fibres of the lower level. Um, and uh, giving them um, a higher realized purpose um, by uh, finding some kind of telos or aim that is more unified than just the scattered kinds of desires. You know, one, one desire goes off in search of uh, uh, a shelter, another goes off in search of immediate gratification through food, another through sex or some other kind of stimulation, um, another through, you know, other, other kinds of pleasure or fun or entertainment. And the person, not just the mind, the person becomes scattered and pulled in different directions. If you were to follow, if you were to make it a kind of strange philosophical experiment to follow any particular desire as soon as it presents itself, your life would be splintered. Um, rather, it's a case of those all being brought into order all pulling in, in the same direction in 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 and those directions being given to it by the um the the, 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 the roles and the ideas the forms um which are, are as it were the the light shining down into those darker desires of the lower mind the light shining from that higher mind um so in that way, then, um, being a, a, a great proponent um, and thinker and experimenter of, of, of ideas like this, Coleridge was a, a, a full on Platonist, you know, um, uh, utterly, um, you know, um, but, but, but with a sort of with a sort of a, a romantic tint to it. Um, in a way, I've said this before, you know, uh, Coleridge has romanticized Platonism a little bit, a little bit. I mean, he's, he's pretty much traditional Platonist, but he's romanticized it. In what way? In what way did he romanticize it? Well, what we think of now as imagination is rather an elevated concept, but it wasn't always like that. Um, in, in Plato's day, Fantasia was uh, related to you know, what we might think of as fantasy. Well, it's pretty much the same word. Fantasy, um, almost in a Freudian sense. Um, it's the, the, the desires, um, the animal body, the animal mind, uh, having their way with, 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 with the mind, with, with the powers available to the mind, and pulling the mind um, in, in the direction of uh, instincts and, um, and, 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 and human and animal you know, desires which are present here. Fancy, fantasia, that's, that, that was you know, the, pretty much Plato's idea of what imagination um, is. It's creating images um, in order to tempt you know, the body. Um, it's, it's um, you know, in, 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 in Plato's Phaedrus, he has this wonderful image of the human mind as having three parts. You, you have we, the kind of the ego or the self, as kind of like the, the charioteer driving two horses, um, but we're driving it in the air. They're, they're winged horses. 
And one is the pure, the white horse flying into the realm of ideas and truth and goodness and beauty, the noble horse. And then the other horse is dappled, you know, motley, sort of black and brown and dark and um, um, mixed uh, with all colored with all these different kinds of desires. And it's not interested in, in, in you know, the light of truth, goodness, beauty, piety, etc. It's trying to pull downwards into the earthly desires. Um, <clears throat> so, um, and uh, Fantasia in, in, in Plato's sense, it was, it was, it's the kind of images of, of earthly temptations are the kind of thing that is drawing, as it were, that, that desirous, you know, um, unpure horse, you know, the horse inside of our own minds and souls, you know, it's the part of us that's pulling us down. It's pulling us to, 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 to become dissolute, to become disparate, to become not one, but to be spread out in different directions. It's the part of you, in a sense, that wants to just go out and get drunk, or that wants to just, you know, go out and be promiscuous, or just to, to forget about keeping yourself tidy and tidying your room, to forget about needing to get some kind of responsibilities, to just follow your instincts, yeah? Um, and that is very much connected. I mean, Fantasia is very much, you know, the Plato pulling in that direction. How did people like, uh, I mean, and the, you know, several hundred years later, people like Plotinus or Plotinus, as some people pronounce him, I'm sure Emil has probably talked to you um, about Plotinus. Is that right, Emil? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so, but he he then, <clears throat> much later, he, he himself also is a full-on Platonist. You know, I mean, many people will say, no, no, he wasn't, he advanced Platonism and so on. Well, in some ways he did. But he did certainly advance Platonism in this direction. He believed in two imaginations, unlike Plato, who had a sort of denigrated version of imagination. I mean, I believe that implicitly, because Plato does say some pretty good things about, sometimes anyway, about art and imagination and religious imagination without using those words, he must have had an implicit view of what we nowadays think of as higher imagination something much more spiritual and noble. But he never in his theorizing um, says that, but I think he needs it. And Pla Plotinus recognized that. Um, and you know, he, 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 he therefore saw a need for two imaginations, the lower one, which is all about fantasies and fantasy um, and following desire, and the higher one, which is a way of sort of, of the mind being able to contemplate the pure ideas, um, uh, you know, the, the forms, the platonic forms. Um, well, this is what we get um, uh, in, 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 in the Romantic era too. The imagination becomes, and it, it, in, the imagination has an enormous effect on culture in, in the sense that we still haven't completely left it. Okay, we had Romanticism and Victorianism and Modernism and Postmodernism and what the heck is coming next, but still, we're also living in the shadow of romanticism in that imagination remains a, a hugely enormous, you know, this concept, this romantic, as it were, concept of imagination, um, which has roots in people like Plotinus, um, still has a huge influence. I mean, even songs like John Lennon's Imagine, you know, um, I think that's still famous today. Um, and, you know, Many, many, many Hollywood movies and Disney movies and that sort of thing in popular culture. This idea of imagination um, is a, as something powerful. You don't need to have some kind of great knowledge. You don't need to be, you know, physically strong or something. But if you have a powerful imagination, you can, you know, reach for the stars. That sort of that sort of idea. It's it's, it's very it's 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 a powerful idea in the public consciousness. Um, and it, of course, it becomes a little bit sentimental or too easy, um, but 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 still, it's it's also a concept that becomes as deep as you're willing to approach it with. Um, and it was romantic thinkers like people in Germany, people like Schelling and Hegel. Um, uh, Kant was getting there too earlier. Um, Kant really thought the imagination was necessary even just for perception, you hold a hand in front of you and you see it as a hand and not just some kind of colors. Because <laughs> every time you see it, it's not exactly the same, you know. Every time you see a tree, it's not exactly the same thing. It, it takes imagination even just to perceive basic things in that simple way. 
That's what Kant called the necessary imagination. So that's kind of the, the beginning of what I'm calling the, the, the romantic concept of the imagination, which is um, an elevation of the, the ancient idea, which in a sense, then it mainly, with people like Plato anyway, denigrated the imagination as something lower level compared to concepts and words. You know, people sometimes, imagination is such a heightened concept because of the romantics nowadays that we often forget it's about images and pictures and such, you know. Um, and that's why it was kind of denigrated because pictures are not as powerful and universal as concepts and ideas, you know, um, work, you know according to the ancients. But no, the but people like Plotinus were already saying that people who are intellectually incapable of deep contemplation, who are not capable of, and I go back to that concept I mentioned earlier, who are not capable of noesis, the higher intellectual intuition of the Platonic forms, where there's no mediation going on. You might get to that level by the dialectic, by the Socratic questioning that makes you realize that what you've been thinking all your life is wrong. <laughs> you know, a, a kind of Socratic dialectic might help you get there. But uh, it seems to me anyway, you know, in Plato, that's like a kind of key and locking the door that stopped you from moving into noesis. But noesis itself is kind of post-conceptual, it's beyond concepts, right? Ordinary everyday thinking, like what we're doing in this class right now, or this, this talk right now, is conceptual. Everything that you're doing at school and at university and a lot of what you're doing at work is conceptual. Mediating things with words and concepts and theories and schemata, you know. Um, but direct intuition is like, you know, I like this tea, I like this coffee, I like this pizza, you know. Nobody can teach you that you like it or you don't like it. You have to put it in your mouth and taste it, you know. It's direct, you know. Uh, things like pleasure and such are direct intuitions, not mediated, right? Not to know, it, to know, I don't know, uh, how to do an activity, to know a piece of science, to know a theory involves conceptual mediation. But to directly enjoy something or to directly learn something through the senses, that's direct. It's immediate, it's unmediated. And what we're saying here is in this kind of romantic platonic um, theory, also the higher level knowledge, what Plato called noesis, um, the, the direct, as it were, intuition of, 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 of ideas, the platonic ideas, the forms, the intellectual, as it were, building blocks, that's not quite the word building blocks, but the intellectual fibers and framework of the whole cosmos, the universe, the order, the system of order, that is <clears throat> um, to, to, to intuit that, you have to go through concepts. And then when you're through it, you're then in this pure space, you've left concepts again. And then apparently, according to Plato and others, you're able to intuit these uh, higher ideas. Now, this is when the concepts of pre-conceptual and post-conceptual come into it. Um, putting a piece of pizza into your mouth and chewing it and saying, oh, that's nice, you know, that's pre-conceptual. No, concepts can kind of help a little bit. You can learn the difference between the different herbs that are used and the different spices and the different vegetables that are used. And so, you know, people in aesthetics today talk about the epistemic epistemic um, um, uh, differences um, um, in, in aesthetic appreciation. If you know the names of the different trees, yeah, and you know a little bit about the biology or the botany, sorry, of them and how they fit into the ecosystem, um, you might probably be able to deepen and widen your enjoyment of a good walk in the countryside. But not only that, you could possibly, and then this is where people have big arguments really in, in aesthetics, you could even possibly have better enjoyment, more pleasure, because knowledge gives more distinctions and more knowledges um, of what's going on there. So pre-conceptual, uh, uh, something like knowledge or engagement 
is about your senses and about pleasure and enjoyment or fear and hatred. I mean, you know, all of these feelings that we have, everything aesthetic in, in, in that sense, in the most basic way, is pre-conceptual, although it can be enriched and enlightened by concepts. But it doesn't matter. You can be a, a wolf man raised, in, raised by wolves in the forest and never have read a book and never seen another human being, and you still know what you like. <laughs> You know, you, you, and, and you don't have any language, but you still have a rich aesthetic. Uh, education and concepts and mediation can perhaps broaden that and deepen that. But still, pre-conceptuality, all of these thoughts and feelings are, don't, don't need the mediation of, of concepts. However, the post-conceptual, which is when, you know, and a lot of people, I mean, a, a lot of people aren't platonic. A lot of people aren't Platonists. A lot of people don't believe in these forms and these ideas anyway. Uh, but but still, um, so you have to take a lot here. Um, but if you give for the sake of argument, you know, that there are these forms, these archetypes, these possibly even the laws of nature are somehow somehow related to these um, law, these these platonic and Pythagorean forms and essences that suffuse the cosmos. Well, they um that unlike preconceptual knowledge, your feelings, they can't really be enriched by concepts. They are another term, I say post-conceptual, but the term I prefer to use is the ideas are praetor conceptual. Praetor means beyond. Okay, feelings, emotions, aesthetics, that's all before concepts. They can be educated and elevated by conceptual thought. Right? Somebody who's a good chef and who can make wonderful cakes and so on, but they've never had any instruction, you know, but it's all by taste and feel. It's possible that education and conceptual learning and reflection can make them even uh, bring them to an even higher level. Of course, they could be a natural genius and they don't need that anyway. But even then, they could probably be advanced by further study in a conceptual sense. Right? But, but the point is, that's being made here is that However, to be praetor conceptual, the post conceptual, you've already passed through the realm of concepts, the realm of theory, the realm of schemas and geometries, and you know uh, whatever uh, concepts can give you. You've gone through that, and you're now in, as it were, the higher reflection of the aesthetic realm, which is the noetic realm. Um, and I think that the romantic Platonists, of whom Pla uh, Coleridge is a wonderful representative, the romantic Platonists um, were onto that. That's one of their, as it were, secrets. You know, that's something that they tapped into. That the, the noetic, the, the Platonic forms, the ideas, all of this rich heritage, which had been, because in a sense, since people like Galileo and Descartes, uh, a sort of more Aristotelian uh, history of philosophy and science kind of, you know, became uh, regnant, became more powerful. Um, uh, and, then, and then empiricism, you know, the world became much more, especially the Western world, became much more empiricist, mechanist, you know, believing only what can be seen and touched and experimented with. And um, we had a kind of a logic of quantity mathematics became a, a, ex, extremely important, as it is in Plato too, but in a different way. Um, what, what can be measured um, um, is, is where our knowledge um, um, will, 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 will um, accelerate from, you know? Um, and that's what happened. The scientific revolution did accelerate human knowledge. Just, human knowledge of what is true just basically shot up. And what we can do technologically just shot up post Galileo, post Descartes, post, you know, Newton and so on. Um, but what was left behind, that's the logic of quantity. But what was left behind was the logic of quality. And so, and the kind of Platonism that perhaps goes with that, or, or even more Plotinian uh, theory that goes with the logic of quality, the lo um, of 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 existing things on this in 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 the empirical world are participating in powers 
life, you know, goodness and truth and beauty and courage and pleasure and happiness and, and the different laws of nature that somehow harmonies the 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 intermingling and 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 the study of the ratios of different qualities and powers became subterranean. It continued, but it only continued through hermetic sciences that we now look down upon very much, like alchemy and the zodiac, you know, astrology and that sort of witchcraft and magic, you know. Um, people like Carl Gustav Jung in the 20th century actually looked at these theories with great profit and found the great depth of ancient learning was in a sense continuing through those arcane uh, channels, um, like a modern kind of Pythagoreanism, you know, uh, um, which itself also had its own secret methods of, of, of instruction and so on. Um, so give me a moment, I'll be back in just one minute. Just a moment. <laughs> And well, um, I haven't really got covered the entirety of this chapter at all. What I've really given you is a kind of prologue to it, but that's fine. Um, we've sort of, you know, oh, has somebody just come in there? Yes. So um, yeah, um, but I believe that's about the forty, the forty minutes up. Um, I think that what I've given you is a is a is a is a is a, is a kind of preamble or a prologue or an introduction to where I'm coming from in this chapter and the kind of ground that's being covered and what's at stake, what's important and, you know, why, you know, um, maybe 15 years ago when I was starting to think about these areas or when I was starting to put together some of my preliminary conclusions, I would talk about the romantic or the romanticization of Platonism in the early 19th century. And, 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 and full on Platonists would say, what are you talking about? You know, what is, what? That, that, that didn't happen. Um, and so I needed to, 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 well, to really show what happened with imagination versus fantasia. Coleridge is very famous for his distinction between fancy, which is all about, you know, instincts and impulses and associations, like the empiricist idea of association, I say salt, you think pepper, you think pepper, you want to sneeze. That's it. And, and it's just basic physiological stuff that's that's very related to the phrenema sarcos or the, the mind of the body um, versus the higher mind, which is, you know, where you get, you know, um, Beethoven symphonies and, and, and you know, uh, the, the Vedanta system of Indian religion and, and Zen Buddhism and and. and systems of law that are you know very deep and far reaching you know the greatest things produced by the human spirit um and there's two different kinds of imagination responsible for that is and that's kind of the romantic idea which i think is um which is an exaggeration but i think in a good direction of what plotinus or plotinus was already onto um as he was quietly correcting plato um, another thing that that another thing that I wanted to just you know stress, I, I'm just repeating what I've already said, um, and but I think it's important the idea of the ordination of mind. Um, thinking of this two level, you know, if you have a two level theory of imagination, you know, you have your fantasy or your fancy and your higher imagination, which is more spiritual and poetic um, and scientific. Um, you also just basically have a, a, a two level 
theory of mind. One is concentrated on desire and the self, and it doesn't really care what's true or not, but it cares about how much power it can get and how much desire it can satisfy. Um, whereas the, the spiritual mind is in a sense disgusted with all of that. <laughs> um, but instead of putting itself off, like some, some spiritual um, thinkers decide to become ascetic or to, to put off the body, like yogis sitting for 10 years in a cave cutting off the body and just growing a beard and thinking high thoughts. But actually, this Coleridgean platonic idea is about connecting both, about elevating the lower mind through the higher mind, about the light of reason, the light of ideas, shining down and percolating deep into the instinctual soil of the lower mind and, and elevating the seeds, as it were, that exist there. Because he's a universalist. Which in religion that means you know it's possible for everybody to be saved, um, almost. Um, but you know he's not speaking in in that religious sense. But that's how the term was originally used. But he's universalist in the sense that nothing should be thrown away, nothing should be completely denigrated. There's no part of you that cannot be spiritually elevated. And by spiritually, he didn't necessarily mean. I mean, for him it was religious because he was deeply Christian. But um, it, it, you don't have to be religious to think in that way. Um, there's nothing in you that you need to be ashamed of because everything, in the future, you might be some kind of teacher in whatever role you have, you, you know. But the first responsibility is to teach yourself. To little parts of you that you might feel ashamed of or little parts of yourself that you might want to denigrate or cut off. No, um, this Plato come Coleridgean system is rather a case of that is the first thing that you must begin reforming, elevating, instructing. You are in charge of all of this existence that you're walking around in. And you can, you must because you can, as, as Kant famously said, you can um, educate that because you have been ordained um, uh, uh, the captain of the ship, which is your body and your soul and your mind, you know. Um, and you have the powers and tools to be that good captain. You can ordain every single part of your multifaceted being. Um, and any one project that you take, you can kind of use all of you <laughs> to get there. Even the parts which you thought were negative or something to be denigrated or cast aside. Actually, there's probably some kind of way that can be put to the good end too. Um, that's the kind of optimism um, um, in this kind of Platonism. And I think that's it. I've given you something very practical, I think, really, although it's got these high-minded Platonic ideas in there. But I think it's kind of like a sort of, uh, it's almost like some kind of Coleridgean or uh, Platonic self-help kind of <laughs> idea, really, I think, the way that I've expressed it. Um, so there we are. I'll stop there. And I want to just branch this out into a chat either observations from your own lives or ideas or criticisms of this idea or further questions or any, any way you want to go. Um, let's go there. Emil, do you just want to say something first as a sort of interim between, you know, talk and um, opening up the seminar idea or? Yeah, you, you, you can hear me clearly, right? Mm, a little bit. Where is the mic? No, hang on. No, it's not bad. Ever so slightly echoey, but it's not bad, really. Okay, well, what? That's great. That's fine. Mm. No, no, it's not. A, it's not. A, it looks on. Um, you should be able to hear me clearly, right? Mm, mm, mm. Okay. All right. Um, do you guys have any questions? Do you have a question? Yeah. Okay. Well, how about we do it this way? Anyone wants a question can come up here and speak right in front of the microphone. Yeah. Does the camera have to be pointing at me or? No. Oh, okay. Hi, I don't know your name. Hi, I'm Carly. Yeah, he snuck in. Carly? Carly, yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I, Carly. Was, I was a bit late. Uh, yeah, I have, I have a very basic question, kind of ashamed of answering, of asking it, but still. Uh, can you please give us an example of where exactly there is a separation between a fancy and uh, imagination, basically the idea of desires that are basic and desires that are noble because to my understanding it all kind of sport goes down from even the fanciest idea the abstract and the creative it kind of goes to a downward spiral based to the basic ones even the idea for example of aesthetics 
they still value purity. What is purity is the idea of calmness, of higher uh, progression, it's immediate desire, it's apparent. To me, it seems like every fancy desire, fancy idea, even artistic purposes go down to basic desires in a way. Uh, where exactly does the second yeah. come from? Right. Okay. That's a good question. I mean, um, that sounds like, I mean, so somebody like Nietzsche, for example, you know, as, as, as it was just mentioned earlier, would say the opposite of, of, of the kind of answer that Coleridge or I would, or, or Plato would kind of give you. And it would be something like, yes, it's all will to power. And it all goes down. However deep you, you, you penetrate, you just get, you know, more deeply entrenched, uh, you, you you just keep pulling up this will to power, um, right? The 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 Coleridgean reply, however, um, to that is, in a sense, that's true of fancy or fantasy. That is will to power of the individual organism. By a kind of narcissism, by a kind of narcissism, the individual self might also work for the good of the family or the good of the community or the good of the nation. Usually not for the good of the world though, it's, it's always me and my group. Um, and um, the big distinction is that the desires of uh, fantasy uh, and fancy are um, basically selfish. That is, this, I mean, that's a negative word, but are self-oriented. And it doesn't matter whether my actions are true or false. It doesn't whether it doesn't matter whether what I say is true or false in pursuit of those desires. The important thing is the acquisition of power to satisfy those desires. So that in my own dream, I might imagine or rather fantasize a certain scenario that gives me some kind of satisfaction, even though that event never happened and it probably would never happen. But also, um, in reality, I could, you know, conjure up some kind of art that is a piece of fantasy that satisfies the uh, fancy of many thousands or millions of people. But it's not high art because it doesn't touch the higher imagination. I'll come, I'll come to that, Carly. But um, I mean, I often give the example of romantic comedy. Do you, do you guys know things like Love Actually? and Notting Hill, and you know, the, those romantic, and Bridget Jones's diary. Yeah, I see them as works of low fantasy. They're fun, they're cute, pretty woman. I mean, you know, Julia Roberts becomes a prostitute in order to go to bed with a, with a millionaire. You know, that's, that's a weird thing to be a cutesy kind of uh, uh, Hollywood fantasy, but still, um, that's, 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 that's what, it's basically catering to Selfish solicitude, selfish desires, um, the care of the self, the promotion of the self. And um, in these kinds of movies, you know, it's like the kind of job of these actresses or the kind of job portrayed in these movies like Love Actually and Pretty Woman. It's, you know, it's, it's for example, Bridget Jones, you know, she's working for um, uh, a magazine or a, a newspaper that's fairly high class. It's kind of like she's an office worker, like your average woman in, in, in the world, but she's a little bit classier and that sort of thing. And then she ends up, you know, falling in love with two or three different guys and they're all gorgeous in their own wonderful ways. And basically any problem she has is all quite cutesy and uh, there's nothing seriously wrong in her world. And it's a fantasy. People go into the movie theatre and they just, they... It's a platonic mimesis. They're like, oh, this is me, in a sense. They're, they're, they're able to be Bridget Jones for an hour and a half, and you go out there feeling lovely, feeling, oh, yes, you know, that's, 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 that's what I want to be. Um, and a lot of romantic com and, and there's, there's, there's bro comedies for men as well, which are quite similar. Um, and it's catering to those fantasies. And the thing is, it's not aiming. Fantasy does not aim at truth. This is the distinction for these Platonists anyway. Fantasy does not aim at truth. Fantasy aims at the gratification of desire, no matter what, even if you have to lie or fabricate. Uh, and fantasy also, as, as has been noted by many people, including in Coleridge, fantasy just brings together disparate elements. It's not a wonderful kind of creation. It's just, for example, Pegasus is getting a horse and it's sticking wings on it, or, you know, making another kind of chimeras. 
um, or the you know, um, it's just taking bits and pieces and gluing them together, um, and that will satisfy your kind of fantasy. Uh, imagination is different. Imagination is what leads to high art. Imagination aims at reality in the sense of those platonic ideas and powers. It aims at truth, um, even when it is, um, in a sense, fi when, when it is fictional. I mean, uh, one of my uh, professors, um, he's, he's dead now, called Colin Radford, wrote a, a nice paper called um, uh, How Can We Be Sad at the Fate of Anna Karenina? I mean, that's, that, you know, um, and Anna Karenina, you know, walks in front of a train and kills herself. Um, and every time we think about it or read about it, we might even want to weep. But how can we do that as philosophers when we know that Anna Karenina never even lived? She was never even born. She never, you know, met these men. She never had this husband. She never had that affair. She, you know, none of them went to Paris. None of, none of this, none of this happened. Um, how can we, or how, how can we, how can we wince and, and cower when just before Mercutio is killed you know, in Romeo and Juliet? He's Romeo's great friend. They're great bros. They're great buddies. And then he dies because he's in the middle of this terrible feud between the Montagues and the Capulets. And it gives you feelings, even if you just try and describe it right now. And yet no Montague, nor Capulet, nor no Romeo nor no Juliet ever existed. What, what, why? Why? Well, one answer to that, I mean, this is called the paradox of fiction, and many philosophers have argued over this, but my answer to that is that it's true because it's, 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 it's aiming for the truth of ideas. It's aiming for the truth of no, noble causes, um, uh, for, truth, for, for truth itself in the human essence um, or the human situation. Um, art, higher art, employs imagination to aim at truth. Fantasy um, employs all the, all the techniques of desire and uh, craft, and it aims at the satisfaction of desire. Um, so I don't know whether or not you agree with any of that or whether you think there's any potential in there, Carly, but that's the sort of, I think, something like the modern Platonist answer to that. Do, do you have a comeback there? Uh, can, I, can I give it all? Does anyone else have Okay, so I've heard two very different things. First of all, is the idea that higher imagination goes to an idea of outward thinking of basically coming from the self to the collective. Uh, the idea, is that first correct? Uh, so you consider- I don't, I don't think so, I don't think so. No, um, I think this movement from the self to the collective is more characteristic of fantasy. Fantasy can be educated to care, to keep caring about itself but to become broader so that one's own family, one's own community, one's own workplace, maybe even one's own country is represented, but it's still the narcissism of self, you know? If I love my country and I'm being a scoundrel for my country, really, I'm just being narcissistic. Okay, really. so... Then it's it's an extension of my ego. Whereas for the imagination, for the higher imagination, in this very rarefied theory, um, there is no, the self doesn't even really come into play. It's just truth. And if the self is completely out of the picture, so much the better. And I think, you know, some scientists like Newton and Einstein and so on who have even have described something similar and mathematicians, you know, have described something similar about the specific kind of imagination they've needed to reach their discoveries, etc. where the self in a way is kind of just an observer, but it's not something that is catered to. Whereas fantasy, the self, and then a bit later, some larger community is catered to, but there's no catering going on to, to individuals or groups in imagination. You're not trying to please a crowd. Um, that's why, you know, artists can, can art, a true artist who uses the higher imagination will often be proud that the public hated his work on the first reception. Whereas somebody who writes fantasy, well, they've simply failed because their job is to please the public. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we'll move into the second idea is the fact that this idea of truth, because here, the, here going to the abstract seems a bit closer to my original question, and the fact that what we consider truth, particularly in art at least, is immediately and- I, I, wish, I, I wish I could see you, by the way, I can't, I can't I see I can you. just, I can do this, I don't see why I can, she left, I was just gonna- Thanks. Sometimes I can't hear you too, it's nice to see your lips move. Hi, Harry. Yes. Uh, so, 
My truth. Oh my God, you're going to ask me a question about truth. No, 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 no. I'm joking. Go on. Uh, oh. Yeah. The idea of at least truth in art is at least partially or almost always immediately tied to the idea of desire. If we could go to such noble high ideas like betrayal, love, uh, society, mm. uh, generosity, and all that sort of thing, they are yeah. immediately tied to an idea of phenomenological idea behind them, of the idea of love is immediately something that attributes to desire. Generosity is something that attributes to our social qualities, which attributes to uh, our um, standing in society and acceptance. It's something that attributes to desire whenever we go. Negative qualities like betrayal are also like immediately juxtaposed to them. Uh, so <laughs> here the idea of truth and this abstract conceptualization goes deeper into like further yeah. away simply on multiple levels, but it still comes to the idea yeah. of fantasy, doesn't it? Or am I just- yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, but in, in fantasy, in fantasy, um, the everything must be resolved happily. It, it, it's more it, it, fantasy must be comedy more than tragedy. Definitely, yes. Um, there, there is a, there's there is an occasional there's an occasional kind of fantasy where, for example, the heroine, the beautiful lady, you know, is allowed to die, um, but only if that brings everybody to a flood of kind of uh, mimetic you know, self-loving tears, you know, how, how glorious and wonderful she was. Um, but um, the, the failure of, 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 of the realisation of beautiful and perfect ideals in the world, that cannot be represented in fantasy because that is a disruption of fantasy. Fantasy is, as Freud said, you know, it's, it's the, you know, some kind of immediate or at least quick gratification of desires. Right, it's not truthful to portray in a, in a Bridget Jones kind of way all kinds of problems happening, and then everything is happy in the end. You know, um, the Disney kind of, or the Disney kind of resolution is is pure fantasy. People have denigrated aestheticians often denigrate that as kitsch, um, where basically no matter how, no matter what technique is used, the desire is satisfied. Um, and uh, simply to use whatever te technique. <laughs> so it, you know, the world is not really like that. People might often think at, 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 a, at a fantasy story or a fantasy movie or a fantasy piece of art. The world is not like that, but it's nice to imagine that it is, you know, and that's fantasy. In that sense, fantasy is cheap. It's betraying the truth of, of, of love or betrayal or the world in order to get a comfortable feeling or a sentimental feeling or some kind of narcissistic feeling. Whereas art that employs imagination um, um, has got space for tragedy and has got, you know, got space for great um, uh, disappointment of desire. Fantasy cannot portray the ultimate disappointment of desire. That's, that's the distinction I'm, I'm making there. Uh -huh. All right, someone else. Uh, I have one somewhat clarification question about ways of nature in the uh, in this latest ideas. Yeah, so mm. by nature, uh, they mean like the world that is beyond concepts, like the world as it is. So and no concept that yeah, the world beyond the world beyond concepts, the world as it is. Is that in the in the post-conceptual kind of sense. Yeah, so uh, when we, for example, explore nature and the world, like the world around us, uh, we can really apply some, like, this is a tree or where a stool or a desk. Mm. Mm. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> mm. The audio is not exactly perfect, so I'm, yes, I'm trying to catch what you're saying. Okay. I can do like this, do human well. Mm. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, other question is, is that, um, so we don't really have a choice, but be narcissists when we uh, 
explain or like just explore the world. So, uh, or even if we want to achieve like this uh, higher forms, higher like type of mm. imagination, we still pursue our own uh, desire or needs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's not that's a very nice question. And uh, how does that relate to something I didn't quite hear earlier about what you're saying about nature? Something at the beginning no, of what you're saying. It, it's two separate questions. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Let's let's look at the second one first, then, because I I think I, I get that a bit. I heard that more clearly. Um, we can't. Is it is it the case that no matter how we wish to aim for that sort of higher. Uh, imagination that aim towards truth and, and ideality um still we can't help be narcissistic i mean yeah i mean you could say that's pretty much a truth of much experience um i think that the answer directly from plato would be something like this the answer directly from plato is plato Sometimes, you know, he, he gave us dialogues where he's putting forward a certain theory and it's sometimes quite technical. But other times, Plato was pretty much romantic, giving us a beautiful story, uh, poetic imagery. Um, and I'm thinking now, of course, of the symposium where, and we've got a wonderful distancing of Plato from the symposium. It's not, it's never, it's never Plato telling us a story, but it always is, of course. But, uh, but but the character of Plato is hardly ever there. Um, there's one one or two possible places where he inserts himself secretly. Um, I think in the Phaedrus, he's uh, there's a Platanos tree, and uh, maybe that's himself there in the background. Um, but anyway, no, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the symposium. But yeah, and it's Socrates telling us about what Diotima, you know, uh, um, uh, the wise uh, sort of spiritual lady taught him when he was a young man about love. And he gives us this um, uh, uh, kind of a rhetoric uh, about the ladder of love or the steps, the akanabosma moi, the, the, the steps towards um, uh, the, 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 the higher ideals. If at first you find yourself attracted to, you know, a handsome guy or a pretty woman or, you know, you, you mm, and then you might be able to appreciate shapes in other things like, you know, hills and trees, and, and then you might be able to appreciate moral qualities as, oh, that's quite shapely too, there's a kind of aesthetic in that. And then suddenly you realize you're, you're, you're appreciating nobility and things which are far purer. And it's not like you're sublimating from something good and then getting the sublime thing from within it. It's rather you're going up towards the source and actually you're going towards something better and better, not more rarefied, you know, you're not shaving this. These steps are not taking little pieces of something that is already good and then getting weaker and weaker, more sensitive and refined versions of that. No, no, no. You're getting more and more powerful essences so that actually what you thought was the only good thing, that, that cute guy over there, what you thought was the only really foie, great thing is actually the faintest, faintest, faintest kind of attenuation or reflection of the real power, which eventually is the ocean of beauty and eventually even beyond that you know the 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 the, the, the sea of good um the, the core principle the mind of god as you know or, or something you know at the, at the very core the very heart of the cosmos but it's not just at the very heart it's also in every damn thing you know um and um there's a kind of rhetorical uh, way um of uh well as a source of optimism when you face the face with no matter how high flown your ideals and how hard you sort of try to go for this higher imagination and these truer, purer values, but still aren't we deep down just selfish baboons, you know, <laughs> and uh, pursuing our own desires and wanting to scratch all those different itches. Well, what I'm saying, what 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 this co-religion idea is saying is you 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 can be you can ordain you you ordain you've been ordained to be in charge of those itches and you don't have to scratch them all in actually not in public and not in private you can actually take the sensitivity which is behind all those itches and corral them or group them together twist all those fibers into one strand and pull um towards that one great beauty or one great truth or one great cause that 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 you really do find yourself enthused about 
know, infused in that greatest platonic sense, you know, like filled with the, you know, the, the, the power of those of, of those ideas. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would say the, the, the answer to that sort of um, Weltanschmerz or something, or face to face with no matter how noble people try to be, even oneself, there's a, there's a narcissism going on. You can find whether you're being like Freudian or Marxist or some other kind of uh, theories critiquing, you know, uh, feminist or whatever. You're all oh, this deep down to selfishness, no matter what he's doing or she's doing or they're doing. I mean, oh, there's something dirty and, you know, or just selfish and narrow-minded going on there, really. Well, actually, you know, um, I think the symposium is a good antidote and a good rhetorical sort of antidote to that. And always try to go back to, to, to if you found any warmth, intellectual warmth, as it were, in that story of the symposium, keep going back to that one. That's a book, that, that's, that's, a, that's a dialogue that can be reread and reread because it's art. You know, um, you can't read a, a piece of analytical philosophy and enjoy it at the same time on the hundredth time or even on the third time. But a piece of music, isn't it weird? You can listen to it a million times. Um, she, um, Kierkegaard said the same sort of thing about uh, repetition, of course, you know. Uh, bread, your daily, you know, give us this day our daily bread. Well, why is it we never get sick of daily bread or daily rice or daily water? I just, I had to take a break a little bit earlier and get some water, man. Gulped it down and sometimes water is just so it just hits all the spots and it's just so and yet there's nothing terribly special about it and yet of course there is um it's these daily things and it, it, again there's a purity in in a work of art which is also intellectually refined like the symposium and like the phydrus and, and like certain parts of the Republic, you know, I would say the laws is, is, is rather boring by Plato in comparison, you know, or, but um, <clears throat> there are something like this. It's, 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 it's a work of art because it's, it, it's not a discovery or an analysis of certain concepts or theories. It's an expression of a power or an expression of an idea. The symposium is an expression of the ideas of love and of the idea of the higher imagination. He never mentions it like this. You see, I said earlier, I think in a sense, Plato has to believe in the higher imagination, even though in his own spoken theories, he actually denigrates the imagination. But that's because he never quite had the concept of the higher imagination. But he does have the concept of being infused by the gods or being inspired by love. Um, and that sort of thing. And it's not as great as philosophy because philosophy is something that you can control. Whereas being enthused by the gods or being enthused by love is chance. It doesn't happen to everything. That lightning doesn't strike everyone. But you can, like a bodybuilder could, it's in charge of building up her own muscles. You know, a philosopher is in charge, can be in charge of building up their own um, noesis, as it were, of, of, of the ideas. So, I mean, uh, I've waffled on a bit too much there. I've talked a bit too much. But basically my answer is, yeah, I think the answer to to what you said there about um, narcissism and, and regret and, and sadness at uh, human failings uh, is to be found in an enthusiastic reading of the symposium. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you reckon? Yeah, so we should nourish our own desires as much as like this highest, higher communal desires because there's still... I mean, I think the wonderful, the wonderful thing about Platonism is the, the, and this relates to what Carly was saying. I'm sorry, I will let you finish. But it's that it, you, you're using the word desires there, but actually it's um, at a certain crux point, it's not desires anymore. It's seeing into truth and oneself drops out of the picture. And, in a, and then after a certain way on the journey, it doesn't even matter whether you live or die in a sense, but that the truth be, you know, fulfilled and, you know, realised and that certain virtues be fulfilled and uh, made concrete, made actual. And then the language of desire, even though one might still be using it, is actually changed in what it means, or it even just drops out the picture altogether. Sorry, let continue. <laughs> oh, it's okay, that's what I was, what I was talking about, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I should have let you go. Yeah. Bad it's teacher fine. there. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. I don't really have questions. And, and what was your first thing about nature? About, no, no, I just wanted to clarify what they mean and you meant by nature. What is my nature in this realm of ideas? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, in, in Coleridge's um, uh, 
because he was religious, of course, and Christian, he had a kind of, you know, theology which framed this kind of theory. Often when I'm talking about this theory, I'm saying it doesn't matter whether you're atheistic or theistic, because this makes sense in its own terms. But Coleridge himself framed it religiously, and that, you know, you've got the conceptual middle, and beyond that you've got the imagination, and the imagination has the power to sort of propel us like a rocket, as it were, out of the atmosphere and into the space or the cosmos of the pure forms and ideas. And then on the opposite version of that, you've got the conceptual middle, and then below that you have the fantasy, the lower level of imagination. And then below that, you have the lower level correspondent of the realm of ideas. And what's that for both Plato and for Coleridge? It's nature. And that's, as it were, the earth. Now, um, for, 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 for a typical empiricist scientist, um, that is the source of everything, that nature. Where, whereas it's, it's a, there's a different idea of nature. In a sense, it's like um, 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 an attenuation of the ideas. You know, um, but yeah, uh, nature is, as it were, the soil out of which fantasy grows. Another way of putting it is, OK, you've got the middle finger there, you've got, and that's conceptual middle. You've got your thumb here, that's um, that's the, the platonic ideas. You've got your little finger here, that's, um, that's, that's your sense, your sensuality, OK? Right? It, it's a little bit like Kant. It's, it's a little bit like pants, reason, understanding, and sense too, or receptivity, you know, with your body, you know, your sensations. Your sensations, that's intuitively, that's directly intuitive. You see something red, you see something blue, you smell something sweet, you smell something dirty, that's sensation, and it's direct, and it's intuition directly. Platonic ideas. In a sense, we intuit them directly too. We might need a bit of training to get there, or we might need a bit of unselfing or unlearning or unknowing to get there, you know, but that's also direct and intuitive. The difference is, of course, oh, oh by the way, this intuition, imagine something disgusting smell. I'm sorry to make you imagine that, but imagine some disgusting smell. In a sense, you become a bit disgusting when you smell something disgusting, don't you? It's like, oh, my head's full of, oh, I can't even say the word. Or something pretty, some nice ch -ch perfume. And, oh, you yourself become a little bit, oh, too. And actually, I'm using words like, oh, and, uh, oh, which are not really words, because these are direct. They're not really, in a sense, they're kind of ineffable. The taste of chocolate is kind of ineffable. You can do your best. Or the colour red is kind of ineffable. You know, you can only really use those words to people who've had those sensations. And the same thing with the platonic ideas, right? You can't really talk about ideas to anybody who's never even had a whiff of one, who's never even had a contemplation of one. To somebody who's not had a noesis or even been on the edge of there, it's really, you can't really have a proper conversation. You can talk about the logic of it, but talking about the logic of an idea is 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 like talking about the mechanics of a smell or something. It, it's it's not the same thing at all. Now in the middle, you've got this understanding, the concepts and the words, right? Now what happens here? Something else I say in this chapter. It's not very good. And I'm, you know, you've got <laughs> my fingers. I'm not very good. But anyway, okay, you've got the higher ideas, and you've got the lower. There you go. The higher ideas, sort of heaven of ideas, and and the rootedness of sense. And in the middle mediating you have the mediality of concepts and theories right now there's a kind of magnetism going on here imagine that as the bar of imagine a bar magnet blue at the top and that's north and red at the bottom that's south and they're pulling in different ways sense is pulling from the earth and from nature and all of your senses reflect the earth right things to be seen are reflected as it were in your eyes and you know, all sorts of molecular chemistry is reflected in your tongue and your nose, et cetera, et cetera. And your, you know, night and day is reflected in hot and cold, et cetera, you know, and all of that. Right now. And, and, and again, our ideas are, in a sense, uh, expressions of um, the platonic ideas. Now, again, just like when you smell a dirty smell, you yourself feel dirty. And when you smell a pretty smell, you yourself feel pretty. The same thing. It's important. Now. In noesis, which is direct knowledge of the ideas, it's impossible 
to know an idea without also being that power. If you know bravery, you are that moment, truly in a platonic sense, you are in that moment at least brave. If you know justice, you have become, at least for that moment, just. If you know beauty, you are at one with or participating in beauty, um, and so on and so on. Uh, it is the, the platonic intuition or contemplation or noesis is the unity and the participation of knowing and being. I This is something that isn't said, but I'm saying it. Same thing on the lower level too, because it's direct and intuitive. You smell some, you know, you smell dirt, you smell something disgusting, and you yourself, your mind itself is filled with disgust and, dis and it, you know, smell something pretty, you yourself unite with that. They are alike, as it were, the North Pole and the South Pole of the mind. They are far closer to each other than the equator. Antarctica and the Arctic, or Siberia, are far nearer to each other in feeling than they are to somewhere like Mali. Is Mali on the equator? I don't know. Somewhere in Africa that's in the equator, right? They look different. They feel different. But actually, you know, the North Pole is closer to the equator than it is to the South Pole, right? But the two poles are, are far more in common than they do to the conceptual middle. In the same way, platonic noesis is direct and intuitive and it's the union of being and knowing. And so is sensation too. It's in a way, in a different way, it's also the union of being and knowing, and it's a direct intuition. Whereas learning in universities and schools and colleges and through books and with words and with your numbers and with your schematisms and your diagrams and all of those conceptual middles is very good and very powerful, but it um, it's nothing like these two because it's non-intuitive. There is no intuition in the middle. It needs content. These two are nothing but content in a way, you know, although Plato calls them forms, but, you know, um, it's, it's a direct intuition. Now, the, this is the kind of the thing I, I said elsewhere in the chapter. What happens is from the top of the magnet and the bottom of the magnet, something human arises that oscillates. That's fantasy, oscillating between, between understanding and sense oscillates fantasy or fancy, and between, and it carries water, as it were, between the both of them. It brings up from the earth and from the sense to our understanding, it brings the stuff that empiricists can then use to make knowledge. But it also brings down a kind of education to our senses, and therefore we become elevated and educated. But also to something oscillating between the platonic forms and the lower understanding. It brings down light, imagination through its direct contact symbolically with the truths of the powers and ideas and the laws brings down that light shines down irradiates the conceptual understanding with the higher understanding of the ideas and educates our conceptual ability so that lawyers can become humanitarians for example instead of just you know um, a little bit selfish, or instead of just obsessed with the numbers and the logic of everything, they actually are inspired by the great cause. You know, um, that's it. That's, that's 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 what I'm going to say. Sorry, I don't know if we have any time for any other thoughts or questions. Or that was that was nice. Thank you. Yes, good good couple of great questions. Eh? I'm in the hot seat now. It's about to get wild. Hello, Emil. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any questions? Anastasia, Maria, no? I have a question about Ellie, but there's an answer. Okay, well, I suppose it'll be me then. Um, see you later. Okay. Did she say that she had a question, but I didn't, I didn't hear what else she said. What else who said exactly? No, no, I was just I saying thought, bye to one of the students. You. No, no, one of the oh. students is leaving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, what's what's um, Coleridge's connection to the um, Cambridge Platonists? And perhaps well, fairly direct, fairly direct. He wasn't, uh, for some small little reasons, he wasn't really a fan of uh, Thomas More, of, 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 of More. He was massive, he was a great fan of Cudworth, Rafe Cudworth. 
Um, he believed, Kudworth believed in, I mentioned the word cosmos a few times, you know, in, in that talk. Um, and, and the kind of, you know, unifying principles um, and ordaining principles where nature and our desires can get ordained by some kind of unifying principle in ourself, which comes directly from the cosmos of ideas. Well, that kind of comes pretty much directly from Rafe Cudworth, um, who wrote a, a rather modestly titled book, um, The True Intellectual System of the Universe. <laughs> you know, um, but and in there, um, uh, Rafe Cudworth um, expounds uh, upon, upon what he thought at the time was modern physics and modern theories of biology and what he and, uh, and he explained it through a sort of a plastic principle that suffused the cosmos. Um, there's a plastic or shaping principle um, all around the world. And it's in a sense carrying, imagine his plastic principle, like a, a, a sort of an invisible sun with sunbeams everywhere. And every sunbeam are like platonic ideas. That's, that's a little bit like a, a, a quick sort of kindergarten um, expression of what uh, Ray Cudworth's theory of the plastic principle was. And Coleridge wrote, you know, several of his poems were directly inspired by that idea of the plastic universal principle. There are uh, ideas suffuse the universe uh, with this plastic or shaping principle. Um, I suppose it's, um, you know, a little bit related to the enlightenment idea as well of progress, you know, that, that there is at the very core of the universe, a kind of germ or seed in everything that is slowly educating and elevating and shaping things towards a more perfect or a greater uh, form. The advancing realization um, of, um, of the ideal, the ideal world is in a sense becoming manifest into this actual world. When I say it like that, it sounds an awful lot like Hegel's system. Um, but actually, Rafe Kudworth was taught uh, in universities in the 1780s and 1770s, 1780s, 1790s. He was translated into German um, and, and read at German universities. And Coleridge himself went for about a year um, and studied um, uh, at Goet Göttingen University. Um, in Germany, where he was picking up further on Kant and uh, later Schelling and others. Um, similarities, uh, uh, connections between people like Hegel and the Cambridge Platonists are also shared by Coleridge, and there are historical reasons for that. So yeah, uh, pretty much on board with Cambridge Platonism, to answer it briefly, yeah. All right, well, um, thank you for that. Uh, we're pretty much just about time up, but uh, are you sure you guys don't have any more? Ms. Says you don't have any questions, really? She's actually really smart, even though she's very quiet. Maybe that's you why- You can email, anyone can, e anyone can email me something later or, or a question or a comment or whatnot, or, you know. Okay. Right. Uh, it was jo jolly nice, really, really, really enjoyable for people to, cut, to sort of have a good, follow the strand of what I've been uh, rather loosely and chaotically saying. It was uh, rather uh, good of your students. have great students if they could follow all those weird little strands and put together some intelligent questions. That made me think that was really good. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for actually doing this talk. Um, we appreciate it. And um, yeah, hopefully you can do it again sometime. Mm. All the best. Yeah, and, and, and likewise, maybe you can give a talk um, at our seminar here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we Thank can. you very much. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank What's you the weather very... like over there? What's the weather like over there? Is it hot, cold? Who's, who's what? Sorry? What is the weather like where you are now? Oh, it's what's the weather warm. like? Yeah. Ah, it's, it's um, well, it was minus three in the morning. <laughs> so I don't, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it's like now, but. Um, well, wow, you have to have your brains ranked up into, into full power to, to keep you all keep your warm. Yeah, it's good stuff. Okay, yeah. well, have a have a good evening, you lot. Yeah, enjoy your dinner, and I'll be in touch. All the best. Bye, bye, class. Bye, guys. See you later. Bye, bye. group. Cheers. Oh, and send me a link to the video at some point when it's done. Probably yeah, yeah, day, I, so. I won't forget. Okay, bye, -bye. thank you.